seaweed ecologist here. Um, I am the phycologist, for those who don't know what that word is. Phycology is the study of algae. You know, phycos is seaweed and algae is the study of it. It used to be called algology, right? But the problem is, is that's a mixing of the Roman word and the Latin word, and algology is actually, algos is pain, so algology is the study of pain, um, which is hopefully what I want to promote in my life. <laughs> um, and so that's what I do here. I teach a lot. I do a lot of work on health forest ecology globally in the state. I've started to do some work um, on seaweed ecology. I'm also the editor of what I'm proud to say is the number one algae journal on the planet, which is the Journal of Psychology. It's actually housed here in Moss Lane Marine Lab, so we're very excited about that. Um, and then I've got a, a quite complicated social life, regarding soccer and lots of children and all that. Um, but so, there, there's the introduction to Mike Graham. Um, this is what I've spent most of my life doing. Uh, I have what I would like to consider really nice pedigree. I worked with, you guys might remember Mike Nuschel. Mike Nuschel was a pioneer in seaweed. Um, in seaweed ecophysiology and aquaculture out of UC Santa Barbara. In fact, uh, we have a couple in the audience who are also students of his. And, and that's where I was originally trained. My first class was in mariculture at UC Santa Barbara with Mike Mitchell in the 1990s, I think, when I took it. I came here to Moss Lane Relabs, got my master's. I went to Scripps to work with Paul Dayton on Cal Forest Ecology. Um, and then I came here after spending a little bit of time at UC Davis doing a, a postdoc. And, and what I like to do is ask the question, how important are kelps to our systems? Mostly, if you take the kelp out, how does the system change? Um, and we've been doing this globally and looking at a lot of different uh, techniques in doing this, but what's jumped out at me um, is that uh, there's a kind of an economy of nature. What happens is carbon and nitrogen flow into our <coughs> systems, right, at the bottom of the food web. So this is a food web, this is a really diverse food web from Southern California, and it's, it, it's gross groups. I mean, it's got herbivorous mollusks, which would be, you know, other things that, that eat, snails that eat plants, and sea urchins, alimony, sea cucumbers, actually it's almost everything on here we eat, um, some of which we actually farm, and the arrows are pointing of where energy flows. So they flow from the organisms on the bottom, which are the, the <coughs> ones that photosynthesize, up to the, the first set of consumers and the predators, and then the higher predators. <coughs> And, um, and it's not really important for you to see too much, but this is a complicated food web. And what we notice is that carbon and nitrogen flow in the bottom, and then it gets distributed out through nature's processes, whatever they might be um, evolutionarily. And this is what we've understood. Well, understanding this actually helped me to look at how we might use these organisms um, to basically study the economy of, of the consumption that we do. And so the question for me had always been, how can I use my understanding of how nature works and how nature moves carbon and nitrogen to better understand how we might be able to utilize nature to take our carbon and nitrogen out, which is what we want. We want the sugars and we want the proteins. Um, and nature's already doing it in the field and we're trying to recreate that in some way. Some of us are doing offshore farming, some of us are doing it in land-based tanks, others are out fishing. I mean, we're doing it however we want, but, but the goal is can we use this to understand that? And for me, aquaculture um, you know, is, is an important part of that. And, and for us, it, it tends to, at least the interest here, is kind of be this nexus between environmental issues, societal issues, and economic issues. None of you are in the aquaculture business to lose money. I, at least I hope, but I probably wouldn't be in this room if you were here to lose money, right? So you need to be sustainable in that way. Right? Um, a lot of us here eat marine protein, and we want to eat marine protein knowing that by doing so, we're gonna be able to eat marine protein for the rest of our lives. We don't want to impact the environment to the point in which we can't eat marine protein anymore. So we wanna be environmentally sustainable. We also wanna be socially responsible. I guarantee you, all of you, and we can all go into this together, like Powerball if you want, um, if, that I could farm sea otters, and it will be profitable. It will be really profitable, right? It'll be environmentally sustainable because I bet we could ranch them right out here and sustain kelp force through what we understand their role in the kelp system. So it'll be environmentally sustainable, it'll be economically sustainable, but the public would not buy it. So socially, it would be dead in the water, right? Because nobody wants to know that, that you know, the chicken they're eating there is actually an otter, um, and that their fur coat came from you know, these ones at the corner. That's not gonna happen, okay? It, it's, it's, it's not meeting this nexus of being economically, socially, and environmentally responsible. And that's just the way we were doing it. So there's a little soapbox. So I found some partners. Actually, they found me. I love bringing their faces up. They're all in the audience. You guys might know Trevor and Art. 
down at Monterey Avalon and Company. In 2005, they found it because they have a great little system there. It's very Steinbeckian if you've never been there. This is Warp 2 uh, with a variety of seafood distributors on top. And if you, there's, a, there's a very subtle little door here, and there's a roll up. You don't really see it until they're open. And, and what you don't realize is there's this big black hole that if you step in it, you plop down onto these docks underneath the wharf. And on that wharf, or on those docks, is um, an abalone farm. Um, it's one of the, the two in this area that are sea based, not land based farm. And that's Art in the top and Trevor on the bottom. And when you go into that farm, you see a series of cages. Um, that are hung into the water, and those cages are stocked full of plastic plates that have abalone that are being raised on them, and they go out and, and through um, their, their permits are able to harvest giant kelp, which is again my specialty on the top, I think grows basically a foot a day, um, and so you, you know, the regulations is you cut the top and you let it regrow, and so they harvest you know, quite a bit a week in order to feed these little cows. They've got, you know, they've got their, their seeds, they basically put the abalone in the, in the Cages, they stuff them full of, of kelp. Um, you know, they're they're working with two native species. Giant kelp's native to the area. The abalone are native to the area. Um, they're working in an area there in Monterey Harbor, which has really great flooding. Mean, this is a this is a really nice design and how to do this. And they've got a great business. And you're going to taste them this afternoon too because they're, they're going to put on a little show for us, which is great. So, and, and this is you know, if you go to Seafood Watch and, and you get your cards, you know, you look at it and there's the green and what's on top? Abalone. Number one on seafood watches green list. Well, it's because abalone starts with A, but um, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. They're there, and, and you know they're sustainable. They're, and we, we love farmed abalone in the state of California. It's great. I used to free dive for it in Southern California before the moratorium in 1995, and, and I remember eating tons of abalone, and, and this is the way we get to do it now, and I'm very excited to, to see this. So what can I do? They're already... On the green list, they're already doing it well. They have minimal farm impact, and people love the story. Well, there's some things going on, and this, this is what these little cows look like. This is a red abalone. This is a farm red abalone. That's a wild red abalone. This is not red. This is kind of what dull brown, gentlemen, right? And why? Because the easiest way to feed farm abalone is to feed them kelp. Well, kelp doesn't have red pigment in it, and the abalone shells get pigmented by red seaweeds in their diet, right? And natively, it, you know, in a natural system, they would eat whatever drifts by them, a lot of which is red seaweed, and green seaweed and brown seaweed, and that's why they have the red color to their show. You have to harvest the kelp weekly, so not only are they not red when you feed them all kelp, you're out there every week harvesting a lot of kelp just to keep them going. That's hard to do when there's storms. That's hard to do when there's lots of rain protected areas and you have to go to certain, I mean, it's, this is not an easy thing to do. It takes effort, labor, and time. And it takes two to three years. These are not, these are slow growing cows. This is like raising redwoods, right? Um, they're tasty, but it takes a long time, and that's labor. As you all know, it's very labor intensive to do this work. So they came to us and basically asked, well, what can we do here? Can we start to look at maybe farming seaweed to augment the diet to help alleviate some of these issues? Can we get a little bit of additional feed? And can we help with, with some of these issues with the marketability of brown? And so this got funded originally by Sea Grant in 2005. Um, and what we did is we started growing another native species of seaweed. This is Gracilera optus andersoni. It grows throughout the state of California. It's extremely common. It's a long strings. We actually have it, uh, some of, of this uh, in our centerpieces out for lunch. You can look at it. It grows like strawberries. You don't need to use seeds. It just basically grows. It's almost like rice. You cut it, you hang it, and as you hang it, it regrows. Um, and then you can just continuously harvest. So you don't have to have a hatchery for grassleriopsis. You just have to have a handful. And you move on. And so we developed a farm. You know, Monterey Harbor, this is Wharf 2, and the, the seaweed farm was right here. And it's still out there. It looks like a giant <laughs> underwater clothesline. And you hang the seaweed on it, and they're able to go to the farm and pull in the red, the red seaweed. And we did a long-term feeding experiment with the abalone that was done in a way where, even though we're academic, as academics, we like to do things a little Places replicated so we can talk about statistical <laughs> significance. You know, it, we kind of take it out of your realm. It's not as relevant to industry. Well, we decided this time not to do it that way. We used the exact same cages. Everything they did was the same. All we did was augment the feeding. So we wanted it to be immediately scalable right back into their industry. 
and that was actually hard for me to swallow because I didn't want it that way. I'm a, you know, I, I'm a statistical person who just wants it this way, and so it took me a bit of time to figure out how industry was really going to benefit from it. So we did this. This is my student Hugh, who then went on to work for the Avalonian Company and is now getting his PhD in uh, in Canada. And so he, we built the farm right there in the harbor. We were getting 11% growth per day, per day, up to 23%. Well, that's about a doubling every week. So basically, you're hanging up these little strands of seaweed. You hang up 100 pounds. You got 200 pounds at the end of the week that you're able to harvest. You harvest that. You can either leave the rest of the lines. Or you can just reseed them with some of which you harvest. Again, it's like rice. You take 10 handfuls for yourself and one handful goes back into the fields, right? Extremely sustainable, very easy to do, minimal farm design. And a lot of times with aquaculture, we have issues with nutrients going into the water, right? Salmon farms is an example. These things are absorbing nutrients. It's, got, it's actually a benefit often to have these things in the system. So we, we, we then did the feeding cycle, 40,000 abalone, right? We did it at their scale. We did it for a year, so it would be relevant. Um, and we started feeding them red algae. As you fed them red algae on top of the kelp, they became snottier, which is really great if you're a snail. Um, they were more healthy, uh, as, we could as far as we could tell. 25% increase in growth by simply adding 5% red algae. On top of the kelp, we added 5% red algae, and we got a 25% increase in growth. That is a 25% decrease in the time it takes to get it mar to market, which means a nine month decrease in the labor to get it to market size. That's where it starts to make so now we took a green industry and made it more profitable, we think, to feed foods. In addition, it only took a little bit of algae to actually make the pigmentation. So now you can have these things live in a tank at a store and say, hey, would you like some of our red algae, or red abalone? And they don't look brown, they look like this. And the, the boys cleverly named it Super Abs, and I was telling everyone, I said, don't Google that, because you're not going to get the image you were looking for when you Google Super Abs. <laughs> But here you can see the line where they were fed on the all kelp diet, and then the line where we added just 2.5% red algae to the diet. And so we had some students doing work. They got into Photoshop, which they love to do, right? Everyone, all the students like to get all techy, and they did a color analysis on the lips on the control animals. Um, and they basically found that there was no statistical difference between the color of the one of the super abs that were fed the red algae and native wild abs that were. So this is kind of cool. So now we took a green industry, we made, we made it more profitable, more marketable, healthier, more resilient. Well, that wasn't necessarily enough because you, you gotta sell some abalone. So how do we prove the abalone? We went to Pacific Edge uh, Restaurant, which is up in Carmel, Chef Mark Ayers, who was there at the time, agreed to do a blind tasting with a bunch of restaurant uh, connoisseurs. We had some magazines there, some local press, um, and we did a blind tasting of the super abs versus the previous uh, method, which is the all kelp only, and 80% of the people appreciated the super ab flavor more. So that is the abalone that were fed on this more diverse diet by including farm algae into that because they said the texture was more like what they remembered when they were a kid. It didn't taste like chicken, it tasted like abalone. Um, and so this was great because it just proved that there, is an, there was an even broader impact of what we were doing. So for me, that was an example of us remembering that abalone don't just eat kelp. Abalone are eating all the stuff that drifts around the ocean and come to them, a lot of which includes red algae. And so we needed to reconstruct that. And right now, you know, if you go down to Monterey Abalone Company, and you know, this information has actually spread out quite a bit. Most of the abalone farms are feeding at one point red algae to the abalone at some time during life. And I know Monterey Abalone Company now makes sure that all the abalone come in there through their system, especially when they're very young, get red, red algae. 